I'm Catherine O'Neill, and welcome to this edition of All About Boston. We have a really great show for you tonight. Joining us in the second half of our show is William Martin, the author of 10 books, um, Back Bay, Cape Cod, The Lincoln Letters. But what you may not know about Bill Martin is that he grew up in Rosendale and West Roxbury, and we're delighted that he's going to join us. Um, over the last several months, I got the opportunity to talk to a lot of you, and I was amazed that when we chatted, most of you brought up the conversations that we had with the three gentlemen who are the guests on our first half of All About Boston tonight, and they are Tom Finneran, Nick Paleogus, and Tom Keedy. And welcome, gentlemen. To all about Boston. Catherine, thank you for the invitation. Well, it, I'm delighted to have you back. It really is. It's a delight. You're a great host, and these two, I'll do anything with these two guys. <laughs> well, you know. They have such low standards, they accept me, <laughs> so it's perfect. Listen, we're all a little rusty, so we can get through this first 30 minutes together. What I thought we'd talk about, and it's a great, you just did a poll, right, David? A couple days ago, yep. Let's talk about the poll that sure. you just did for the uh, Massachusetts governor's race. Yeah. It was very comprehensive, and it showed um, Martha Coakley a strong Democratic candidate. She has a 13-point lead over Charlie Baker, uh, and Charlie Baker cleared the field in the general election against the other four Democrats. So right now it looks like Coakley the favorite against Baker, Baker the favorite against the other four Democrats, uh, and Coakley even stronger in the Democratic primary. So the two Toms, does that say that Martha got over the um, Senate race? Oh, sure, I think yeah. it does. And I'm not surprised mm -hmm. because she's up until that race, which was really an aberration, up until that race, Martha Coakley had been a strong and impressive candidate on a regular basis. In Middlesex County, the biggest county in Massachusetts by far, David could break down the numbers and really show you the, the impact, the meaning of Middlesex County. And then uh, at least twice, if not three times, on a statewide basis for Attorney General. She's a very credible candidate. And whatever advice she had or whatever sense that she had after her primary when she kind of went into neutral, uh, while Brown was, you know, stepping on the gas, uh, I, th I think she's well beyond that. So it was a good day for uh, Attorney General Coakley. Oh, sure. The, the poll was, I mean, her strength was amazing. You know, all, all the demographics you'd expect, uh, women, de registered Democrats, uh, those people who trusted ABC News, CBS, NBC, CNN, all the networks except for Fox, she beat Baker by. So um, she had widespread support. Not, not to say the numbers won't change. Uh, or that the race is fluid in any way, but you know she had a pretty commanding lead. The only good news for Charlie Baker, from what I could see in the cross tabs, was if you looked at the people who said that they knew both candidates, because some people haven't heard of Charlie Baker, Baker only trailed by seven instead of 13. And if you looked at the people who said they were following the governor's race very closely, and only one in five likely voters today are following that, the, the race very closely, Baker led by eight over Coakley in that one little subset. So Ooh, there that's is. A, but that's an interesting piece. Sure it is. You're pretty accurate, David. You're like a. He's the best poll. Yeah, it's unbelievable, best. right? Really, seriously, you are. You're pretty Thank accurate. You. So what does, Tom, you are advising uh, Martha Coakley. What do you do with the numbers that David just furnished? Uh, well, first of all, it helps Martha Coakley immensely in fundraising. Right now, uh, going into February, the caucuses, uh, it shows momentum, it shows, shows name recognition. So I see two things. One is fundraising, and second is the caucuses and helping her get to the majority in, uh, I believe, the first week in June. Thank June. you for bringing up that word, caucus. A lot of people don't understand yeah. that in a couple of weekends, a lot of crazy Democrats are going to be gathering in a lot of church basements. Well, let's not call them crazy. Well, uh, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, because it's redundant. <laughs> oh. It's like, this is a tough, yeah. This is a tough crowd. It is a tough crowd. It's a tough crowd. <laughs> so let's explain. Catherine's it. right. <laughs> They're crazy. Let's explain the caucus process. In order to get viability, a Democrat must go to the convention and get 15% of all of the delegates who attend that convention. Yeah. yeah. On the first ballot. On the first ballot. Right. 
And in order to be a delegate, you go to a caucus. So take it away, guys. So you're chosen then by the fellow uh, citizens who show up. You have to be a registered Democrat, and uh, then you gather. And you know we kind of make light of you know, your description of all these crazy people go to caucuses, but there are really uh, very specific issue-oriented people who show up. So let's say of the Palestinian whales, they're going to show up. Right. Uh, and yet, there's going to, there are going to be a whole host and of other things. And will they have a candidate save the Palestinians? Uh, they may or may not. They may want to play a role. And you know, I kind of goof around with some of the, you know, some of the subject matter. But they, uh, in many times, they're just very, very specifically oriented to one or two issues, as opposed to Tommy Keaty could go and have a good uh, feel and a strong relationship with Martha Coakley, and he's there as a Martha Coakley person. He's going to try to organize his neighbors. And David could go on behalf of Steve Grossman, and I could be there for Juliet Kayyem or whatever. So it's really a, it, it, it's a mixed bag. It's a little bit of a boula bash. You have some issue people. You have some candidate people. And, and what happens if you don't get 15 percent? You're not on You're the ballot. You can't run. You cannot run. No. You cannot run. Consider not as a Democrat. Not as a Democrat. Consider a scenario where the five is Democrats. Is that democratic? That doesn't seem. Well, democratic. the rule the rule was changed seven or eight years ago, but but consider a scenario where let's say Steve Grossman and Martha Coakley each get thirty five percent on the first ballot, and the other three candidates, Juliet Kayyem, Donald Berwick, Joseph Avalone, each get ten percent. They get knocked off the last three, and it becomes only two people on the ballot in September. And does that hold for the lieutenant governor candidates yes. in all of the that state? Rule is, okay. That rule is across the board for all Democrats who are running for any statewide office, treasurer, auditor, attorney general, uh, governor, lieutenant governor. So this is the first hurdle for all of them. That's right. And, and, your, question, that. and your question about is that anti-democratic, is that undemocratic, that's exactly what Brian Donnelly said 25 years ago, at least 25 years ago to a Democratic convention. This is an outrageous rule. Any Democrat who collects sufficient signatures from the citizens of Massachusetts should be allowed to put his or her name on the ballot as a Democrat. But the activists, the caucus attendees, said, no, we don't want that. This is kind of our game, our uh, power play. So it's a bunch of insiders, then? Is that right? I would say Democratic yeah. activists. And activists. Say, activists, yeah. And I would also uh, agree with uh, Speaker Finneran on this, is that going back to Brian Donnelly, challenging the convention, there was a court case brought by City Council Fred Langone hmm. when he was running against Ted That's Kennedy. That's why these guys are on the show, by the way. They know everything. And he was Go running ahead. against uh, Ted Kennedy. He went out and got uh, qualified with his signatures, but didn't get 15, or at that time, 10% on the first ballot. Challenged it and lost in court. And ever since that case, uh, going back, oh God, in the early, uh, 70s, uh, we've always had two, two criteria. One, to get to 15%, and second, 10,000 signatures. Uh, and getting 10,000 signatures is, is a job. Was this a way to bet out the fringe candidates? Is that what the process is about? Or it must mean something, right? My sense of it, I'll defer to the historians here, but my sense <laughs> of it is that this was Mike Dukakis's way of taking out Ed King. Uh, when King, surprising, with a surprising victory in 1978, mm. beat Mike Dukakis, it stung Mike Dukakis and his supporters. And they decided to kind of uh, reorient the party and take it over, take over the party apparatus. They did it through a, these sets of rules that set up caucuses in February and attendees. And Mike Dukakis, not surprisingly, won the nomination against the incumbent Ed King. So then they had their classic uh, battle in 1982, and Mike Dukakis was reelected. But so it was it was it was kind of an inside political move. How do we uh, negate or kneecap Eddie King and get prior, you know primary position on a ballot? They did it through a caucus and a convention. Let's talk a little bit about, and I don't know her. <clears throat> I'm just bringing her up, Juliet Kayyem. Okay. How does she get 15 percent on the ballot? She's not what you would probably think of as an, an, an insider, right? She hasn't been in town all that long, right? How does, how does she get there? Does she make a deal with somebody? How does that happen? I think that it's, uh, it's, it really is going to the various town committees that are meeting and presenting your case. Uh, a couple of weeks I received in the mail a, a CD 
on her candidacy. I did too, actually. And, um, and I watched it. And, you know, she probably sent out five, six, seven thousand of those. And it's about, you know, getting to know you and then, you know, hopefully organizing uh, people who want to uh, support someone who's not Martha Coakley or Steve Grossman. Right. No, and I remember. And the convention likes new blood. Yes, they do. Um, yes, they do. You know, especially there are certain parts of the convention that like new blood, and and there is a scenario if it's Juliet Kayyem, Martha Coakley, and Steve Grossman that she becomes the Deval Patrick of 2006. Never run before. Clean, fresh face, uh, articulate, uh, and middles the two incumbent constitutional officers. Um, that's a possibility. Um, but you know, she may not get the fifteen percent. You know, you try to catch but, kind of Elizabeth Warren lightning in a bottle. Correct. And Elizabeth Warren, professor at Harvard, and all of a sudden she's a U.S. senator. Why? She was able to present herself in compelling ways to a variety of constituents, and Juliet Kayyem might very well have that same ability. It's a little bit well, like catching. it's a very difficult job. Oh, for it's not easy. To do that, no, right? it well, sure isn't. Plus, you plus the convention players aren't all necessarily elected at caucuses. You've got student delegates, okay. you've got uh, minority delegates, you've got ex officios. And so there's, there's pools of delegates, elect, elected and unelected, that you can draw upon. And, and it's, a, it's the classic case of coalition building. Oh, sure. You mentioned, for example, gee, how does she get to that 15% if she's not a kind of a, an insider or an established player? I think you used the phrase, does she cut a deal with somebody? Mm -hmm. Well, if you're Steve Grossman and you have 40%, you're well over your 15. Right. You might love the idea of having another woman on the ballot. You might. You might love that idea. Yeah. Gee, guess what, Juliet? I think you are a fine, fresh face, and you deserve a start. Stop moving delegates over, and all of a sudden, Juliet comes out of that convention with 18, 19, 20% at the convention. Her name's on the ballot. Let's talk about numbers. I remember specifically John Silber's delegate count oh. at that convention was 742, because <laughs> I worked with John Silber. Okay. And we, you know, had buttons that... Oh. I think it was 7742. So that's all they need, right? Is about 1,000 votes, 700 votes? Does that sound right? Give or take. Mm, yeah. 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 It's, uh, I mean, but it's, it, it's a lot. It is a lot. Silver made it by, as I recall, by the skin oh, of his teeth. Yeah. By the skin of his teeth. And, and, and uh, David had mentioned kind of ex officio and other caucus attendees. These would right. be party people, state reps, state senators who go, that kind of stuff. They moved uh, a lot of votes for Silver. They really did. And it was that movement that gave Silver, got him on the ballot. Right. Otherwise, Frank Bellotti is going to be the nominee. Uh, uh, well, Frank was the nominee right. anyway, but Silver would not have even been on the ballot to beat Which him in the primary. you bring up a good point. You can not be the nominee and still reach viability and still oh, be on the ballot. Sure. Oh, absolutely. Right. Right. Yeah. Easily. Okay. Easily. Okay. And, it, and it's not necessarily true that the convention is kind to every Democrat who aspires to make the ballot witness Elizabeth Warren. Right, I was just going to mention that. You know, full court press on Marisa DeFranco and, you know, knocked her off the ballot. And rightly so, the thinking of the, of the delegates was she shouldn't be distracted with a primary, focus on Scott Brown. She did, she cleared the field, right. and she yeah. beat him. Yeah, it's a good point. What was your biggest surprise, David, in your poll? Well, I, for me, it was the margin in the Democratic primary because, you know, I, I sort of, being a digital person, I sort of thought of Martha Coakley, Steve Grossman, both sort of institutional, constitutional office holders. But to see Martha Coakley 40 points ahead of a fellow constitutional officer, and it's not like Steve Grossman's not working. It's not like he's not raising money. He clearly is. Um, that was huge in, from a statistical standpoint to be that far over 50 percent, and then your closest competitor at 11 percent. That's a big number. It's, so she's going to be tough to beat. They're staggering numbers, and you, you, you mentioned David's accuracy, really, how credible he is as a pollster. I'm stunned by it in part because Steve Grossman, I don't know that I've ever seen anybody work so hard. For the last two years, he has been everywhere. Everywhere. He's well known, he's well liked, he's visible, he's active, he's moving around everywhere. It's as if literally he is no longer sleeping. <laughs> uh, and that's been going on for a couple of years. So for Martha to have the margin that David's describing, 
put me down as stunned. Honestly, and she's a good candidate, as I said earlier. She's historically been a good candidate with the one exception. Uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm really stunned by that margin. Let's talk a little bit about guys. I know Tom Keedy just came off of a, a mayoral race. I'm a little election fatigued. What is the general populace thinking? Do you think that there is? Well, if you think about it, you know, you go back to the Elizabeth Warren race, and then right after the Elizabeth Warren race, John Kerry steps down to uh, become the Secretary of State, and then you have the Ed Markey, Steve Lynch race, followed by the Mears race, followed by a, a congressional race. Um, and it's, I, I think there is fatigue right now. Yeah. Um, I think there's money fatigue, yeah. and I also think there's just political fatigue, like let's just watch the Patriots or let's watch the Bruins, but I don't want to really talk about politics right now. Don't, the, don't, the, don't have fatigue, he's absolutely mm -hmm. right. There's don't have fatigue, there's voter fatigue, it is all set in. Worse in our little neighborhood in Dorchester because we've had rep crazy. elections, it's state crazy. senate elections because of all the dominoes right. that keep falling. Now the dominoes will settle in and we'll be back to the pattern. But as we now approach what usually would be an exciting time, you know, nine months out before we choose a new governor, people should be saying, oh, ho, ho, let's get the sneakers on. We're about to sprint. And uh, people are saying, oh, please, leave me alone. Come back and see me in whenever. Well, Maybe let's never. talk about, thanks for bringing that up, Tom, which is why you're a guest on our first show. <laughs> let's talk about the 13th Suffolk and the 2nd Suffolk. The 13th Suffolk district election is Mayor, I love to say this, Mayor Martin Walsh's former seat, and the 2nd Suffolk is Gene O'Flaherty's former seat. But if you do it by numbers, your audience says, what is she talking right. about? So let's do it by... Right. Gene O'Flaherty has represented Chelsea. Chelsea and Charlestown, and Marty Walsh has represented a chunk of Dorchester, a small piece of Southie, a little piece of maybe Roxbury, Mattapan. I'm not quite sure how, how the lines cut in. But <clears throat> it's a Dorchester seat, fundamentally, and a Charlestown, Chelsea seat. Now up for grabs, because Marty's the mayor, and he left the legislature. And Gene O'Flaherty, uh, it's a big, big loss to the legislature, I'll say, to lose those two gentlemen. But uh, now Boston has them as leaders, and Gene will go and be his uh, corporate Council, which is a great opportunity. So we have now, I've been doing a little reading on the folks from the Dorchester seat, and I yep. think all of them say that they worked for Marty Walsh. <laughs> Would you be surprised? No, 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 you know what I mean? So we have <laughs> Are another... they going to announce that they worked for somebody <laughs> right, else? Know, right. <laughs> we have another group of people out there door knocking in the snow oh, sure. in Charlestown, in Chelsea, and in Dorchester. Yeah. I mean, it is never ending. Do you have any idea, and I should never have, um, I shouldn't ask this question because I don't know the answer, but I think you will. How many votes it, will it take to get one of these guys elected? I have no idea. I'll defer to like these Like it's two like 3,000, right? No, it'll be significantly less, less than that. In a Democratic less. primary, and it depends on how the votes split. If they split evenly, 750 votes could win. Chances are it'll break into two or three tiers, in which case, you Well, I meant 3,000 vote altogether. I think. Possible. Yeah. Possible. Yeah. But that's, yeah. you know. Depends it, on the weather. Depends on a lot of Depends on the organizations. Can they identify the voters most likely to vote for them and get them out on a, t on a Tuesday in, when is this thing? Five March weeks? March. Okay. Right. So on a Tuesday in March, we could be having a howling blizzard. The candidates themselves might not get the vote, let alone, you know, their erstwhile supporters. And it, it seems it, a bit <laughs> unfair. Like, People don't even get to know these fine candidates that are running because yeah. they're all wonderful candidates, yeah. and you don't even get a chance to. It's even a very, meet them. it's a you know the fancy word would be truncated. It's a yeah. truncated campaign. It's very shrunk down. And you're right. There's an element there where you say, "Gee, I'd like to take the measure of these ladies and gentlemen who are running." over a longer period of time. I'm just not sure. I know half a dozen of them, and I want to see how it separates out. But and the thing is, they have to do it again in September. Yes. That's right. Yes. Yeah. So they get elected March 4, mm -hmm. and then they have to run in September. That's yeah. right. 13, 1,400 votes could win yep. if 3,000 are cast. And that's not a lot of, you know, it's five or 600 families. You could, have, you could have one or two candidates within, one or two uh, uh, candidates who don't make it, second and third, who are within 50 to 150 votes of, of the winner. And if they had a, had a little bit more time, or there might be people who did not even run because they didn't have the time to make the decision with their family, kind of attend to the most basic things in life, and then 
announce their candidacy and begin where they may have done that if it had been postponed till September. So if you're a Democrat, guys, how do you catch Martha Coakley? And if you're Charlie Baker, what are you thinking about right now? Well, if you're a Democrat, you have to get Martha Coakley one-on-one. -on -one. The way the field is currently structured, it, it, it favors her in terms of uh, the, the, the core plurality that she's pulling in right now and the, the passion that she has for the key issues that she's been working on over the last two or three years. Um, in terms of Charlie Baker, I think he has to be happy with, the, with some of the, the, the finer points of the poll, which is as people learn about both candidates, as people have equal information about both candidates, the margin closes. It goes immediately into single digits, and then potentially he can overtake her um, as people become more aware of what's going on. And to your earlier point about people being voter fatigue, even in our poll among all, everybody was a likely voter, was screened out to be a likely voter, but even among the likely voters, only one in five say they're following the governor's race very closely. So we know that they're going to vote, they are self-identifying that they're going to vote, but they're admitting to us that they're just not, that, you know, they're not following the race right now. I think um, if you watch Martha Coakley right now, her handlers are doing a very good job of everything is Charlie Baker. They're not talking about any Democratic opponents. It's always Martha and Charlie, Charlie and Martha. And so she's trying to make that a race. And I think David's poll pushes that. So let's play a little political judo because you asked about voter fatigue. Uh, but there might be... Um, Democratic fatigue that begins to set in. So if you're Charlie Baker and you're seeing what Tommy just described, Martha Coakley keeps kind of setting herself up against Charlie Baker. If you're Charlie Baker, why wouldn't you begin to force Martha to deny and disclaim Deval Patrick? You've got a death at DCF. You've got terrible oh mismanagement goodness, huh? at the Division of Labor. Yep. You have further mismanagement here. There are a number of things. Now, look, you know, the governor can to come up with credible and rational explanations for probably all of it, but nonetheless, he's having to explain. If all of a sudden, people- So you coupled Coakley and the governor? Hey, right. is, the, is, is this, is this uh, are you gonna continue this pattern? How is it going to be any different? Aren't you all one and the same? Look at what happened just last night. I was uh, uh, reading the Globe, the Globe had a, a debate, uh, you know, a, a kind of I a mini that. debate on the Globe. Uh, at the Globe, the Democratic candidates, all in lockstep on every issue. Wow, if I'm Charlie Baker, I'm looking at that and I'm saying to myself, oh, Tweedledum, Tweedledee, isn't this something? Did you all watch the governor's State of the State speech? I did. I did not. He's just an unbelievable speaker. Oh, he's great. It's unbelievable. Oh, he's very, yeah. I think he's probably, yeah. th I think he's probably the best campaigner I've ever seen. Retail, really, really Obama. retail. Well, here, here's the interesting thing with, with Deval Patrick. His personal popularity is high. It's higher than yeah. Barack Obama's in Massachusetts, which it, it never used to be. But on the issues that Tom is talking about, he's vulnerable. So people are saying, okay, yeah, there's a problem with DCF or there's a problem with this particular agency. But they're not blaming Deval Patrick, just like they weren't blaming Barack Obama for the longest time until you had six or seven in June of 2013 that were condensed. You had the AP phone record scandal, you had the NSA, you had Benghazi, you had IRS. So, uh, the IRS, and, and all within that, you know, May-June period of time. And then Barack Obama's numbers started in the high 60s in Massachusetts. In our last poll, he was only at 51. Deval Patrick was in the high 50s. So. In terms of his personal popularity, I think engaging on the issue is in, is 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 important for um, for Baker to do. I haven't seen him do that because I think he fears that he was painted as an angry Republican last time, uh, which hurt him with certain demographics like women, and he's not doing that. He's not engaging Martha Coakley. She's engaging him, and it shows on the poll. Guys, very thank you very much for coming on. We can we, do it uh, forever. 30 minutes yeah. are up. Can you <laughs> yeah. believe it? So you'll come back from time to time, oh, sure. right? Yeah. During sure. this election cycle? Oh, yeah. I am telling you. We're I'm like homeless. Some, we I'm wander around the sidewalks <laughs> waiting for your call. I know. Oh, you're I'm me. not as nervous as I was when we first started. I am telling you, the people that came up to me and mentioned you guys on this show, it was, it was unbelievable. 
Thank said God for David. Thank God for Tommy it. Keaty. That's all it's I can say. Tom, 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 Tom. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, thank we'll you. Be, thank you Catherine. We'll be right back with Bill Martin, and uh, we'll be right back. Welcome back to All About Boston, and we are delighted to have New York Times best-selling author William Martin. But the reason that we're really excited to have him is because he grew up in West Roxbury and Rossendale. And welcome That's right. to the show. Catherine, how are you? Good. Nice to see you. Thanks for having me. Now, I have done a lot of research on you lately. Good. You good. have written. There's a lot of it out there. There is Most a lot of it Most of it's it positive, out there. I hope. It is. It's mm -hmm. all good. You've written 10 books. Yep. A lot of our readers are very familiar with your books. Everybody in Boston is familiar with Back Bay. It, that's right. Mm -hmm. But if you will, if we could talk about, I didn't know this when I met you, yeah. that you actually wrote a Roger Corman film. Yes. I wrote uh, a movie called Humanoids from the Deep. Now tell me about that. Was that a great experience? <laughs> He's like legendary. Let's talk he about He is legendary, yes. Tell right? our audience. You, you, when you're in Hollywood, if you get the opportunity to matriculate at Roger Corman's College of B-Movie Knowledge, you do it. And I wrote uh, a film for him about guys in rubber suits, the rubber suits with the monsters, uh, who come up out of the ocean and terrorize a California fishing town. And uh, it came out in 1980, right about the time that Back Bay came out. And for a short time, I had the unique distinction of probably of being the only author in America ever to have a novel on the New York Times bestseller list while I had a movie on the Video Times video bestseller list as well. And that was Humanoids. And uh, I can get into the plot for you. Well, tell <laughs> us a cast, little bit. I actually <laughs> watched a little of it last night. <laughs> you, you did? I did, oh, yeah. good, good. And, and how many brain cells did it kill? You None? know what? It was very, because I'm a kind of film buff, right, I, right. I was very familiar with Roger Corman. You got Corman. the idea. But, well, I Roger, did. Roger Corman uh, would, back then, and even today, give an opportunity to young filmmakers and talents in Hollywood whom he thought had a future. And he'd get them to work cheap. I worked cheap on that movie. And uh, nevertheless, who was I to turn down the opportunity to work for him when you looked back through his uh, collection of other young talent right. that he had developed, and it included Martin Scorsese and Peter Bogdanovich and Francis Ford Coppola and Jack Nicholson Incredible and a lot of other, Robert yeah. De Niro and a lot of other people. So the opportunity to write the movie was not uh, one that I had to think twice yeah. about, even though I was not born to write horror. So let's, I write historical fiction. Let's talk a little bit about how your journey began. Mm -hmm. You went to Harvard. Right. You decided that well, you... I, and we won't I, hold that against I you. Started, I started at the Robert Gould Shaw School in West Roxbury. You did? Mm-hmm. Uh, I went there from kindergarten through eighth grade over on Mount Vernon Street in West Roxbury and then went to Catholic Memorial. And uh, at Catholic Memorial, I was already... Or at the Shaw School, I was already in love with movies, with the big stories on broad canvases, the historical yarns that were so popular at that time in the late 50s and early 60s. And somewhere along the line, I decided I wanted to be part of this storytelling business. So after Harvard, I packed up and headed to California. And uh, in California, at the USC Film School, I quickly figured out that the most direct route into the business would be to write screenplays. So I developed my skills as a screenwriter and found that the screenplays that intrigued me, that I wanted to write, were not the ones that Hollywood wanted to turn into movies. Big westerns and stories about the battle for water rights in Southern California in the uh, early 1900s. These were not the things that Hollywood was making in the late, uh, late 70s or so when I was trying to break into the business, uh, when I wrote Humanoids, in fact. So I turned to an idea that had been in my head since the fourth grade at the Shaw School which was a story about treasure that sinks into the mud of the back bay before the back bay is filled. So you were thinking about that That's since right. the fourth grade. It came That's from amazing. a geography class in which Miss Houghton described for us 
the way in which the back bay had been filled, how it had once been marshland and tied flat and little rivulets running through it. And then in the mid 19th century, as the city expanded, they decided that they would make more land on that marshland and they layered it in 20 or 30 feet of sand and gravel that they trucked in or brought in by train from Needham and then built upon it the most beautiful part of the city. And as she described this for us and talked about the excavation of New England Life Hall right on Boylston Street, she described the, the discovery underneath New England Life Hall in the mud of a 2,000 year old Indian fish weir. And I thought to myself, wow, that is really cool. What if there was buried treasure down there? And I put that story away and I saved it until uh, 20 years later when the wolf was at the door and nobody in Hollywood wanted to produce the movies that I was writing and I dusted it off and it became Back Bay. And uh, Back Bay was finished just before I wrote Humanoids. I didn't know that Back Bay would do as well as it did and it stayed on the New York Times bestseller list for quite a long time and uh, guaranteed that I uh, didn't have to have a real job again after that. Let me ask you a question now. In Back Bay, and a lot yep. of our viewers are very familiar with your Peter Fallon right. series mm -hmm. books. You have five of those, yes. right? Yes, yes. Why haven't you ever written a screenplay for Peter Fallon, just out of curiosity? Because he would be, wouldn't he be like a He'd great be cool. He'd be great. HBO guy? Right. Or, wouldn't he? Well, uh, after City of Dreams came out, that's the fourth in the Peter Fallon series. I've written ten novels, and five of them, as you point out, are the Peter Fallon books. Back Bay, Harvard Yard, The Lo uh, Lost Constitution, City of Dreams, which is basically Back Bay set in New York City, right. and then The Lincoln Letter. Uh, after City of Dreams, the, the producers at ABC decided exactly what you've decided. And I optioned the book and the character, and it looked as if we might have a series on television that would have been the Peter Fallon series in which you would have seen the history and then the buried treasure story and it would have been a, a, a completely self-contained 13 week uh, oh, what story. Happened? What happened is what happens with most things that we write, uh, at least as it relates to Hollywood. It, things never quite get as far as you hope that they will. The odds are tremendous against anything happening uh, even after you've optioned something. Every time somebody gives you money uh, for your work, you cut the odds in half in Hollywood. So when you option something, the odds get cut from 1,000 to 1 to 500 to 1. And if they renew the option, the odds get cut from 500 to 1 down to 250 to 1. And if you know a little bit about math, and I do know just a little bit about math, you know that you can cut something in half again and again and again unto infinity, and it may never happen. So what I learned a long time ago, after having spent so much time in Hollywood, was that I should never count on trying to please the whims of people who produce movies. What I should try to do is please the tastes of the people out there that enjoy my novels and satisfy my own storytelling instincts at the same time. And that basically is what I've been able to do now for uh, th the 30, 35 years since I started writing Back Bay. All kidding aside, yeah. you are a storyteller, mm -hmm. but your, you, your genre is historical fiction. Right. So you have to be in a historian. So you're actually yes. an yeah. expert in a lot of areas yes. in our country's history, particularly presidents. I like to say I get a graduate education in something new every three or four years. So that, that yeah. I mean, that uh -huh. is a very specific thing that you do. Yeah. You go into something that has already happened yep. and you insert mm -hmm. your little spin right. or drama. I, I bring fictional characters into the history. Good historical fiction it is, to my mind, about the experience of, his, of fictional characters created by an author to represent uh, the reader, in a way, right. 
uh, so that the fictional, uh, the fictional character can bring the reader closer to history. And quite often we know what's going to happen in history. We know, for example, in the Lincoln letter, at the end of the Lincoln letter, we know Booth's going to get him right. when we go into Ford's theater. I'm not, right, I'm right, not into right. alternate history. Uh, and yet there is a, another drama that's unfolding in Ford's theater that night with my fictional characters that is, is, kind, is driving you through the story and, you, and you're watching that drama unfold while out of the corner of your eye you're watching John Wilkes Booth walk around the back of the uh, dress circle and head to the door where the president is sitting. So you, you get this this great in intensity of not only experiencing drama, a small drama within the history, but of experiencing the history itself, sometimes right out of the corner of your eye. And that's the way that a lot of my novels work, uh, particularly the, uh, the big historical moments, which I never, I never change. Uh, what happens in my books historically is happened. Is factual, right. Right, right. You have Cape Cod sitting there. Cape Cod is about the uh, uh, lost log of the Mayflower, and it's about the death of Dorothy Bradford, who history tells us fell off the Mayflower into Provincetown Harbor after having crossed the Atlantic uh, while her husband was off exploring the Cape. Uh, William Bradford, who would later write the great seminal work of American literature of Plymouth Plantation, describing the first winter and then subsequent experiences of the pilgrims. Well, I read about this and I just speculated on whether uh, she had jumped or actually did fall or was pushed. And that became the basis for the whole novel. So you jump, sometimes you use history to jump off from, sometimes you use history as the framework within, t t t within which you tell your story, and sometimes, as in the case of uh, some of the novels in which the presidents pop up, like The Lincoln Letter or Citizen Washington, you're looking right in their eye. But what strikes me about your work, too, is the tenderness that you deal with our neighborhood, mm -hmm. our city, right. Cape Cod. I mean, they are almost characters yeah. in your books. Mm -hmm. and there is such an expertise. I mean, you can tell yeah. that you really walked these streets. I sure did. Yeah. Well, Boston is my home. And uh, when you're a novelist, you can live anywhere. Uh, I could live in Los Angeles. We lived there for four and a half years. Or I could live in Florida, which wouldn't have been a bad idea yesterday when we got 10 inches of snow. And yet, this is the landscape of my imagination and of my family's imagination. All the Martins grew up in the South End on Gloucester Place, and uh, the stories became like uh, like great chunks of Greek mythology when they would when they would tell these tales of the 1930s and the Depression uh, in the old South End. And all of those things fed into my imagination when I was a kid, and then just walking past the buildings, the, the old state house or, or the old north church or going over to visit the Constitution. All of these things stimulated my imagination and continue to do, it, do so today. When Even though I don't all, you can't keep writing about Boston, Boston, Boston. Right, the right. rest, the books travel around the rest of the country. Although we'd love you to. Yes. Yeah. When did the Lincoln letters come out? Uh, Just, that came out a year and a half ago. And how's it doing? It's done very well. It was, yeah, it was a bestseller on uh, barnesandnoble.com for a while and Excellent. the Boston Globe. And uh, I've had a very nice time going around talking about Abraham Lincoln. Excellent. Yeah. And it, this mm -hmm. is the month of precedence, by the it way. It is. We've had four, the month of, of, February. four mm -hmm. of our presidents were born in February. Yep. Washington, Lincoln, mm -hmm. Reagan. Yes, that's right. Today is Ronald Reagan's birthday. As and a somebody fact. else. I can't remember who, but. Uh, There's another one. Yeah, um, yeah. It will come to me. But so this is the month of presidents. Yes. And you are an historian, mm -hmm. really. Mm hmm. And I've had the opportunity to. Uh, well, in every one of those books uh, on your desk, a president makes at least a cameo appearance. And uh, in, I think just about every one of my historical novels, there's a president at one point. How long does it take you to write a book? Well, uh, have you ever clocked uh, it? Too long. Too long. Pretty much. Because there's so much research involved. Uh, and I try to visit locations and then read the primary sources and then 
the secondary sources. Uh, and, and then, of course, when you read one of my novels, particularly the Peter Fallon novels, you're going back and forth from past to present. I'm telling one big story, and then within that big story, I'm telling Peter Fallon's story, and then I'm telling the historical stories. So there are arcs, and then arcs within arcs, all of which I have to make make big sense. Charts, the or? whole thing, I carry it all okay. in my head. Okay. But it all has to make sense to you. you. You have to feel that you're reading something for a reason. So it's almost like getting two novels in one when you read one of the Peter Fallon novels. As a result, it almost doubles my work. And so, not that I'm complaining. Uh, and so that sometimes is the reason why the books take so long. Cape Cod took me four years. Lincoln, however, took about two. Now, when so, you go and visit a place for mm -hmm. your novel, yep. tell me how William Martin, the author, visits some place that he's going to write about. Yeah. Do you walk around with a notepad, or do you just... I tell just, about that. I, go, I go and walk and look, and occasionally I'll pull something out and jot a note down. Some things just jump out at you about a place or a location, the facade of Ford's Theater, for example. It looks today as it looked on the night that Booth uh, walked out of the Star Saloon, which was right next door, and walked in at about quarter of ten into the theater. Uh, other, th other places you need to go and stand and look and imagine what was there, because it's not there any longer. One of the amazing things that I learned when I was writing the Lincoln Letter is that Constitution Avenue on the north side of the mall was once a dirty old smelly rotten canal. Washington was cut with canals originally and uh, as the canals fell into disuse because of the arrival of the railroads the uh, canals became as I say rotten smelly old places that make great locations in novels. So you go to the mall and you look and you say I, I wonder what it looked like then and then you track down photographs that will show you what it looked like then. What did the Capitol Mall look like in the Civil War? There was a big hospital uh, right in the middle of the mall uh, and then the canal skirted that hospital and of course in, in the novel the hospital becomes a location as well. Uh, so I do several layers of research when I walk the ground. Uh, I try to reimagine it, I try to see what's there, and you know, the light still falls on Washington, D.C. and the old Back Bay today, just as they did 150 years ago. And the slant of the light and the color of the air and the sky are things that you can still capture as, as they were then. You're uh, also, we, yeah. I have to get this in, you're also yeah. an award-winning um, documentary. Yes. Talk about the documentary, which I tried to watch, but I couldn't yeah. get my hands on. Oh, yeah. You, well, you wrote a documentary called George, George Washington. George Washington, The Man Who Wouldn't Be King. It ran on the American Experience about 20 years ago, and uh, it was uh, very well received at that time, and I think they still use it in schools. I'm surprised you couldn't catch it on, the, on, on an Amazon download. I couldn't of some stream kind. it, no, yeah. but I yeah. ordered it on Netflix. So. And out of that film, I got a lot of research and visited all the battlefields and all the places where Washington's life had been lived. And out of that, I developed the novel Citizen Washington, which is a very different kind of novel for me. I haven't gotten to that right. one yet. But, but uh, you brought it for me, so yes, I'll read it. Yeah, yeah. But that one took me, brought me face to face with, with George Washington. And one of the things that I try to do in all of these books, when I introduce you to a president, and allow you to look him in the eyes, is to uh, show you that he was a human being. Right. A guy like Washington was fascinating on many levels because he was not the stone, the great stone face. Uh, it, that only came later. He tried to become that while he was alive, but it wasn't until oh, 20, 30 years later that I think it was Hawthorne who wrote uh, uh, did anyone ever see George Washington naked? I do not believe that he had any nakedness. I believe that he was born wearing his sword and his white wig, and he made a stately bow to his mother, and then he went off and invented America. Well, that really isn't how Washington, uh, Washington 
started off. First of all, he never wore a wig. He powdered his hair. But secondly, when he was a young man, he was a grasping, land-hungry young surveyor with a fiery temper, uh, a petulant guy, always looking to blame other people for his failures and his mistakes. And out of that very human kind of individual, and not entirely likable individual, emerged the George Washington that we come to know and respect. Uh, he was a great leader. Right, right. Because among all of his talents, he never quit, knew how to endure. Uh, when you read about the 1776 campaign, which we studied closely in the, in the film and which I write about extensively in Citizen Washington, you watch a guy who is beaten in New York and he's beaten at White Plains in the Westchester County and then he's chased across New Jersey by the British and the American Revolution looks as if, as if it's over. He writes to his brother, I've never been in such an unhappy state since I was born. He talks about going to hide out in the West and conduct the, the revolution as a guerrilla war from the Alleghenies. Uh, he gets across the Delaware and he sits there and he looks across at Trenton where the Hessians have already taken up winter quarters. And uh, this is described in, uh, by Dr. Benjamin Rush, who was no Washington admirer, goes to visit him in his farmhouse headquarters in Pennsylvania, and Washington is doodling. Can you imagine Washington doodling? I don't think you can. But when you read the primary sources, you find out there was Washington writing little things on slips of paper. What he was writing, one of them blew onto the floor and Benjamin Rush picked it up and said, what's this, victory or death? Washington said, that is the password and countersign for an attack upon Trenton uh, on Christmas night. Washington was not going to quit even then, victory or death. It was very strategic, that yeah. battle. He, mm -hmm. The people, the folks were drunk from Christmas, right? I right. Mean, he... Well, the, 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 there is now some historical dispute as to whether that was the case. Oh, really? that, but uh, the, um, the, the Hessians didn't have a lot of respect for the Americans, and they called them country clowns. Is that your favorite period of history, Bill? The, the... It was until I immersed myself in the Civil War when I wrote uh, the Lincoln Letter. And, and coming out of the Civil War was rather difficult. You know, the Lincoln letter consumed me for so long right. uh, that, uh, and I learned so much about the American Civil War that I really um, found it just difficult to So you like wartime away. presidents, it feels like. Well, it isn't so much that I like them. It's that the wartime presidents uh, are challenged in ways that other presidents aren't. And don't forget, Washington really wasn't a wartime president. He had been, he fought the revolution, right, but he when he the became president, president right, right, right. his challenge uh, was to knit this, this very disparate political structure together and hold it together, this, this new thing, this constitution with this bicameral legislature and this tripartite government. Nobody ever, had ever really tried something like this before. And what he was trying to do as president in 1789 was hold together those who felt that the country needed a strong central government and those who felt that that government governs best which governs least. And that continues to be the American debate. It was the debate at the Constitutional Convention it's going to be the debate in the gubernatorial election uh, come November, when you will see Republicans and Democrats struggling over what is, the what is the true vision of a successful government. And all of the issues that we face today in regard to the state or in regard to the broader life of the nation itself, pick Obamacare, for example, as a, as a point of debate, all of those issues, somehow or another, were confronted by people like Washington and Jefferson and Hamilton, who had very divergent opinions. Washington, Jefferson, and Hamilton in 1789. That's why I love to write historical fiction, because the more things change, the more they stay the same. We have to wrap up, but let me ask you just one quick question. You must feel like you know these guys, right? After you research, oh, I do. Yeah, 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 yeah. You can really tell do. when you talk about them. Yeah. Yeah. Thank it's you for. Fun. Must be. Thank you for coming on All About Boston. Now, go and buy Bill's books. You can get them at Amazon.com, 
BarnesandNoble.com, yes, right? Yes, or Barnes and Noble, or, or your Barnes favorite local bookstore. Really, and Peter mm -hmm. Fallon, he's going to be on TV soon, I can tell. I hope so. Thank you for watching tonight on All About Boston, and I'd like to thank the best cable access crew in the whole world, and we'll see you next week with the state representative candidates. Don't know if they're going to be from Charlestown or Dorchester yet. Thank you.